this is kind of the long, fancy title that we use the journal article. Maybe a more appropriate one uh, is, what are people actually doing with topic models? People seem to like them, but the question is, wh what are they really for? What, what are they doing? Um, and I'd like to give you um, three answers that, or th three things that I'd like to say today. Um, first of all, we, uh, some colleagues and I did the same sort of analysis on the same corpus in two different ways, uh, with grounded theory, which is a method from sociology, and with topic models, a method from natural language processing. And spoiler alert, we found pretty much the same thing. So two different methodologies ended up being very similar. I explained why we thought that was a good idea, um, but th that's sort of the highlight. Um, in more general, the second thing I want to say is that this sort of implies that the, the thing that topic models really are good for is what I want to call insight-driven analysis, where you're really looking for some kind of high-level insight. And that's not always what they've been used for. And okay, that, that might explain differences in performance. Um, and third, I want to talk about why we think insight-driven analysis is the right to, um, application for some natural language processing methods and not for others. And, and to uh, draw on the, um, the formalism of a matrix factorization, not only to show that a bunch of things that we've talked about are actually almost the same thing with a few small tweaks, and why those small tweaks would make the difference between something that's good for what I would call inside-driven analysis and something that's more good for kind of downstream analysis. Okay. But if you want the really short version, I would say that you, when you talk about a topic model, you should take model really, really literally. So you know, here's a, a 3D, okay, plug. 3D uh, <laughs> view of um, our new campus on Roosevelt Island, uh, which I visited on Tuesday on the way here. Um, and, and if you have this kind of 3D model of a space, you can sort of look at it from different directions that you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to get in that kind of overview sense. And, and this, I think, is a, really a very literal um, idea for, for how we should be using this type of, of computational model of text. So as a way to sort of make a little miniature version of the corpus that you can inspect from different angles. Um, and that, that's really what that tool is good for. Okay, so I want to say that, that grounded theory and topic models are, are kind of the same thing or, or can be used for the same thing. So I want to start by talking a little bit about these individual methods. Grounded theory is something that's really coming from the sociology and, and um, ethnography literature it's from the late 60s. And the idea is that you start with a whole bunch of documents. Okay, this is, this is the grounded part. So you don't come with, with ideas about what's in the documents. You come with the documents themselves, and you read them. You read them over and over again, and eventually you start adding codes. You might put little annotations. These could be literally like little post-its of different colors on different documents. And so you start to, to find correspondences between things that are happening. And, so, and you read it again, and you read it again. And eventually, maybe you can generalize those codes into some sort of higher level categories. Again, you know, you're grounding your categories in the individual codes. But maybe you're coming up to a higher level of abstraction. And maybe at the top, you come up with some sort of sense of categories. These are large scale ideas that, again, are sort of generalizing the concepts that you have, um, again, grounded in the actual documents. Okay, so. Topic models, what are these? Well, uh, this is a, a, something that mathematically goes about to about 1999. The term topic models was really introduced by Bly uh, and, and, uh, and friends in around 2003. Um, you start with a bunch of documents. <laughs> uh, and you assert that there are some number of topics. You might notice that I'm visually cueing you about certain things. Um, and, and you know the, the the assumption that I'm making is that we assert that there's a, a certain fixed number of topics. You can you can uh, you can reduce reduce that assumption, but I don't think you really need to. And you set an algorithm to read the documents over and over again, uh, maybe a thousand times, and iteratively um, build a, a connection between certain aspects of these documents and the topics. Okay. And, and operationally, the, the way that's often done is by sort of assigning each individual word, there's a meta joke here, uh, taking each individual word and sort of assigning it to, to one of these topics. So you can think of it as sort of underlining each word in the corpus in a different, different, um, different color. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. You can sort of softly weight things. 
but this is the basic idea. And, and so you can then look at the model. You can take the model and inspect it, use it as a, as a physical, like miniature model of a corpus by, for example, taking all the words that are underlined in blue and saying, what's the most frequent word of those? What's the most frequent word type? And if you sort those in descending order, you get something that looks like this. This is probably a fairly familiar um, output of a topic model. Uh, these, are, these are two topics. This is a model that was trained on Yelp reviews by my grad student, Xander Schofield. Uh, the first uh, topic is a, is a fairly good description of uh, restaurants that I, as a vegetarian, would probably not enjoy. Uh, the second you know, uh, is an interesting one because it shows some of the, 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 the vulnerabilities of this model in, in that you'll notice that it's conflating um, uh, pet dogs and hot dogs <laughs> because they've got that same word dog and, and dogs. Um, now, that, that would be a fairly easy one to, to to fix because we've just changed hot space dog to hot underscore dog, and I'm 99% sure that, that would just disappear. But again, it's doing a fairly good job of identifying pet-related businesses. Um, and so if we think of this in terms of, of our 3D model, our, like our little miniature of the corpus, um, this, this is a really valuable tool because, for example, we now know that there's a certain number of steakhouses. We could probably guess the proportion of steakhouses in the Yelp corpus. We also might not have known, you know, Yelp is associated with restaurants. We might not have known that they have reviews of, of pet-oriented businesses. So again, th this kind of gives us that sort of high-level overview of uh, the, the miniaturization of the, the corpus. Okay. So, all right, first thing I want to tell you. So how do these two methods, topic models and grounded theory, relate? Well, you can probably already guess why, why Eric Balmer and I, sort of in, in talking about these methods, started to realize that, that we were really doing something very similar. And so we took a case study, um, and this is a, a, a challenge where people were, were um, supposed to voluntarily leave Facebook for, for 99 days. And this originated with, with a media company in the Netherlands. Um, we were not in any way involved with starting this, but once it started, my colleagues are involved in survey research, so they got in touch with the organizer and said, hey, can we sort of suggest some things that you might want to have in your surveys, which were, were supposed to be at 33, 66, and 99 days. Um, so the survey that they came up with together um, included some sort of standard Likert scale things, like do you strongly agree, strongly disagree, um, some categorical things where you sort of were supposed to circle adjectives that you felt described your experience. But the one that was interesting to me and the one that was hardest to deal with was the big sort of free response boxes. So they, they had some questions like, did you go back to Facebook? Um, what did your friends say if you did or didn't? Um, and so of the many thousands of people who, who signed up for this challenge, about 5,000 of them uh, did one of these, at least one of these surveys. Um, about 20% of those had returned at some point, so they'd sort of break, broken their pledge to not go on Facebook. Um, of those, there were about 2,500 useful responses in the free response section. Um, a lot of those are from the same person because we asked multiple um, questions per survey and there were, there were multiple surveys. Um, so there, there are, there, okay, I want to say there are a lot of methodological problems with this as a study of people leaving Facebook, but it was still a really interesting phenomenon that we wanted to, to study. Um, so on the whole, we got about 2,500 useful responses. Many of them were kind of short. Um, but the, the important thing here is that this is, this is sort of the intersection of the applicability of these two methods. So this is a corpus that's small enough that we can read it. But it's also large enough that we can do some, some interesting things statistically. So, that, so that we thought this was a really good case study. OK, so remember this figure? This is the, the grounded theory model. So we're going to look at what the humans thought. This, so these are my colleagues, Shion uh, Guha and Emily Chuan. Um, they, they did the full grounded theory analysis on this. And, and we're going to look at the categories, that, or the, sorry, the concepts, the sort of mid-level concepts that they identified. Uh, so again, this, this is people describing their experience either successfully or unsuccessfully leaving Facebook for a certain period. Uh, the, the, the categories that the humans de detected were sort of triggers for returning, like why would you need to return? People were talking about that. Um, describing specifically the need to communicate. Um, moral judgments, so how did people feel about the things they did or didn't do? Um, renegotiated use, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, social reconnection. Uh, connection through Facebook and also connection with your sort of IRL friends um, and, and reactions of friends. Okay. Um, Mid-level, or sorry, the, the, the topics, 
that I found. So I did that part of the analysis. Um, again, so I'm just going to show you that that standard view of, of words in sorted order, descending order for, for these topics. We used a fairly small number of topics, like about, about 10. Um, I, I did not communicate with the grounded theory folks. So the fact that, that about 10 topics that I liked and the eight categories or six categories that, that they liked were, you know, that, that, that was an interesting, interesting correspondence. So I'm not going to ask you to look at these a whole lot. Um, but you'll notice that, that we were not being very aggressive about removing stop words. So we took out things like and and the, but, but not a lot else. Um, here's some more. Uh, there, there were a couple of topics that, that were sort of very overly specific, like something about birthdays that was kind of garbagey, so we didn't really include that in the analysis. Um, there was one uh, topic that was all words in Portuguese. So there were a lot of people from Brazil who, who signed up for this challenge, and they talked about it in their own language. The humans ignored that. Um, the, the, the computer uh, identified that, here, oh, here's a bunch of words that really happen together a lot. It's a topic. <laughs> um, so that, that, that's an interesting difference between the two methodologies. Um, but if you look at like she, her, friend, our, one, wanted, death, photos, best, um, y you might think if you were sort of used to topic model practices, you know, they, these kind of look like maybe stop words, like pronouns we might think about removing. And I just want to zoom in on this because um, it's actually really interesting. So if, if we look at um, so this topic four, so only just check messages returned because, and compare it to that one um, that I was flagging here, number seven. Um, so we can look at these individually. Okay, so, so here's the, the, the words that were present in these. So there's a certain amount we can get from that. But, but what was really useful and what I found was, was absolutely necessary was actually going through and sorting the documents by their kind of loading on these topics. So actually looking at the documents that, that highly um, participate in this discourse. And, and here's some examples. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to read these because they're important, um, but a little hard to, to see from the back. So topic four, an example document. This is typical. This is, this is what you'd see over and over again if you sorted by this topic. Got sucked in, but I quickly went back to staying off and just checked it once a week for responses to messages. Boom, full stop. Topic seven, again, this is typical. You would see a whole bunch of these. Um, and, and you know, okay, e even if you can't read this, what, what do you notice about these? Long, short, okay. Um, so I didn't re I don't really classify it as returning to Facebook as a woman in her 80s called to ask me to verify an address for a book signing that was only listed on the person's Facebook page. We deleted a section there. Um, the book signing was over it an hour away, and she would need to secure a ride and have an accurate time. So I did log into my husband's Facebook, went directly to that person's page, got the information, and signed back out immediately. So these two people are saying basically the same thing. They went back on, but then they got off. But the one on left. On the left is a short direct statement. This is a, a sort of the mode of statement of fact, whereas the one on the right is, is it's a story. It's someone telling a story about the reason that they, they went back to Facebook. And you can speculate about why someone felt the need to, to expound in this storytelling format. But I would argue that what the model is finding is the difference between those two discourses. OK. So if we go through and, and you know, after reading a bunch of documents, uh, describe um, my interpretation of these topics. It was something like the first one is positive responses from friends. So, like, we're happy you're back. Um, nece uh, ne necessary for communication. Third one is sort of nobody cared. Um, the fourth is that sort of the one I showed you, the brief guilty return. Um, and fifth was negative emotions. I'm, I'm skipping the Portuguese. I think you can interpret that one. Um, and the seventh with, with this sort of stories, so the storytelling modality, and then positive emotions and sort of changed use. Okay, um, this was not obvious from the the top words. So I'm not suggesting that we got any of this just by looking at words. In fact, quite often it was quite opaque to me. It was only until I actually read some of these documents sorted by the topic loadings that it all made sense. Okay, so we made a big grid. Um, the, the grounded theory categories are on the top. The t LDA topic uh, are on the side. And we sort of identified the discourses that shared both dimensions in one particular cell in the middle. And what you'll notice is that 
there's a lot of correspondence. So it's not one-to-one, -one, but there's a lot of areas where there's, there's, is empty. So this is, this is a pretty strong match. Um, I'll just go through some examples. Um, so this is, this is two of these intersection groups, and just to remind you, that column is, is triggers for returning. That was the, the human assigned um, category or concept. I forget the top two levels. I'm not a grounded theory expert, so it's that, that middle. So within triggers for returning, thing, things that the humans had identified as triggers for returning, and remember, these are both grounded. We can, we can go back to the original documents in both cases and, and look for the overlaps. Um, of those things, the, the, the machine separated into the sort of, the, the distinction I just showed you. So the sort of brief description of a utilitarian need to communicate and a, a, a sort of major life event that requires significant storytelling, okay? Um, here's another example, that renegotiation theme that I mentioned earlier. So that the machine divided that into two topics. So one was, was sort of negative emotions. So this is renegotiation in the sense of, I realized that I couldn't control it and I felt bad about that. So I thought I could control it, but I can't. The, and, and the positive emotions where I, I realized that I didn't need it. I got off and I didn't care, and now I feel really good about myself. So it's renegotiation in that sense. So I think this is another really good example of how the, the humans and the machines were seeing sort of the same thing, but it was sort of like a two-to-two -two relationship where the, the, um, the machine really feels that those discourses are separate because people are using different words but the humans are, are identifying some commonality, even though it's kind of diametrically opposite. Okay, so the, the summary is, if you think about the, the, the convergence here, I mean, people talk about grounded theory as a bottom-up methodology and, and LDA as, a, as an unsupervised method, and I would argue those are kind of the same thing. Um, both of these use iterative refinement. They start with something that's basically random or, or sort of very, naive and, and you know, one involves reading a whole bunch, the other involves um, uh, actually iterating many, many times. Um, we found that the, the, the correspondence was really best at the kind of the mid-level concepts of, um, of grounded theory. So not the lowest level codes, not the highest level um, categories, that's it, but that kind of mid-level of, and, and so if you think that LDA topics are going to give you high-level categories, you might be confused, and I, I'd, I'd love to talk more about that. Um, and finally, think about your assumptions. So with the, the most challenged assumption of grounded theory is this idea that you can have an open mind but not an empty head, that, that you c come to a corpus and, and still be able to, to, to let the corpus speak for itself. Now, the, the computer has, it, it, it's not vulnerable to cultural biases, but it has its own assumptions, and those are sort of mathematically encoded into the model. Okay? Uh, but the most interesting thing maybe is that the, the grounded theory approach took about two weeks with, with or multiple weeks with, with two highly skilled researchers, whereas the computer-assisted theory, and I, I want to emphasize that, computer-assisted, it was not just the computer spitting out a result that I, I took to, to my colleagues. Um, that, that was me and, and the software I wrote for about two hours. Um, and it, it really was necessary to do that targeted reading. Okay? So if we want to summarize, um, you know, here's, here's sort of what grounded theory looks like. You, know, you have your highlighter, you have your index cards. Um, I would argue that this is kind of what, what computer-assisted reading looks like. This is a, this is a picture of, of what's called freestyle chess or centaur chess, where it's a, a human chess expert who has access to a chess program. And what, what's been found is that people who have access to, to chess programs can beat both the best chess programs and the best unaided humans. And so what I would argue that what we were doing is really like that, that, that we were using the tools as a way to, to, um, to enhance and, and provide a different perspective on the corpus, but not just the machine itself. Okay, so the second major thing I wanna tell you is, um, I think we can, we can generalize from this result. So, Specifically, I would say that there's pr fairly strong evidence now that grounded theory and topic modeling are doing sort of the same thing, or can be used to do the same thing. Um, but there's, there's a more general idea of what topic models specifically are good at. And you know, it's, there's grounded theory, but there's also sort of exploration or, or exploration 
topics over time, this sort of more general exploration of a corpus. And, and uh, a slightly different aspect is the idea of like a focused measurement model. Uh, this is something more coming from, from social science where you don't necessarily want the, the sort of full model of the corpus, but maybe there's some aspect of it that you really care about. And so if we think of like the, the Luke tool, which is sort of operationalizing um, linguistic ideas, or, or um, I think the, the DW, yeah, <laughs> roll your eyes, uh, or the, the DW nominate tool, uh, does anyone know this from, from political science, which operationalizes the idea of, of um, uh, political polarity. Uh, the, like, political bias is, is, a, is a squishy concept that was not a, able to be measured until people came up with these models. And, and topic models offer that same sort of ability to say, here's a thing that I care about, and I want to, I want to create a, a random variable, or is it, random variable is a hard word to parse, but a, a variable in a model that represents that thing. Um, so just to give you an example of, of a, one of these analyses, this, this is a, a, an analysis of um, the Proceedings of the Modern Language Association by Underwood and Goldstone, and they've identified sort of the, the interrelation between, between topics, and, and the, the lighter colored ones are newer. Uh, so just to, to zoom in on that, uh, the, this, this word here is cultural. So that's sort of the, the newest concept in, in uh, English scholarship. Um, in contrast, okay, here, here's a bunch of things that, that people often think topic models are good at. And in fact, you know, if you want to do document classification, you should really just use word counts. Like it's much better. You're losing a lot of information by using a topic model. Um, language models, current neural networks, much better. Um, collaborative filtering, SVDs, much better. Um, and, and this sort of fine grade word similarity, word embeddings, do a better job. Okay? And what I think um, binds all these things that people think topic models are often good at but are not really necessarily the best at is that they're all um, aiming at something outside the model. They're using the model as some kind of intermediate step that you can then do something else with rather than looking at the model as an artifact in itself. Um, and so if you think of this distinction, what, what these are going for is, is what I would call representation-oriented modeling, where your goal is to find some kind of compression of the data. If it's interpretable, great. We like that. It makes us feel warm and fuzzy. But if we don't have interpretability, it's not a deal breaker. Because what we really want to do is, is something else that this is an intermediate step for. The insight-oriented modeling, which I would argue is what, what topic models are really for, is your, where your goal is that high-level overview. Interpretability is vital there. If you don't have interpretability, you have nothing. That is the whole point of this exercise. And the representational capacity, OK, that's nice, but it's, it's really interpretability. And the goal here, the, the, the use case, I want to know something. So that's how you know that, that you're in an insight-driven sense. OK, so why would one model be better for this than another? So I want to take a very brief Yes, I see, brief tour through uh, uh, a, a really interesting um, idea called matrix factorization, show that, that a bunch of things that we know about are, have this similarity, but, but with small tweaks. Okay. So our goal in matrix factorization is to find a basis. This is sort of like, you know, you can think of the three-dimensional basis is going in different, and, and you can address any point in space by some combination of those. Um, in the sense of topics, um, the topics are the base components, and you want to represent all of your documents as combinations of these components. Usually it's, it's a more of a metaphor, sometimes it's a little more literal. Find prejudice and zombies. This is sort of, okay, so. Um, so the way we do this is we take a text, we count the words, we create a column vector, which might be word counts. We could stack those together, then that set of vectors becomes a matrix. Um, we could notice that maybe there's some words like woman and window that kind of go together and, and represent that com combined document as a combination of some set of themes, half the first one, half the second one, none of the third one, you get that. Um, if we zoom out so that we can't really see the numbers, maybe we sort of get view that looks like this, primary colors, a basis. Uh, we could stack those together. You know, more realistically, what we have is these mixed up views. And we want to find some basis that gives us the, the sort of pure components and their allocations in the individual columns. 
columns. Okay, all right, zoom out again so you can't really see the, the colors and you get something that looks sort of like this where you have, say, words by documents matrix which we're factorizing as some set of word factors and some set of document factors. Uh, you can do a mathematical trick, multiply those by it themselves and that allows you to shrink the thing in the middle. You can then collapse this together and eliminate the, the words from, or the documents from the model. And you get this sort of matrix of interactions between words and words. I'm good. good. And you can shrink this down to some sort of factorization of, of uh, this whole thing as a combination of two low dimensional features. That's a lot of linear algebra, so here's a picture of Basil the bunny. He's an important rabbit, lives in my house, eats all our kale. Uh, so why am I talking about this? Well, so if you think about this factorization model, there are two important questions. What is it that you put in that matrix on the, the right-hand side or left-hand side? And how do you do that factorization? And, and there's two options that are commonly used for both of those. You can either do complete co-occurrence within a document. So a word that occurs here and a word occurs here have some sort of relationship. That's kind of the full document co-occurrence model. Or you can say that words only have sort of a sliding window of, of correspondence. Second, you could, you could choose whether you want to do an orthogonal uh, singular value decomposition where you can have positive and negative entries, or you can decide that you want to have non-negative entries where you can only have positive or zero. If you put those together, then what you find is that an orthogonal full document matrix factorization is basically latent semantic analysis. If you add a non-negative constraint instead of orthogonal, you get a topic model. Same model. If you do orthogonal and sliding windows, you get word embeddings. And that last quadrant is uh, a little more fuzzy. Brown clusters are probably the closest projection uh, but it could be interesting. And what's important is that this column is the ones you want to use for downstream analysis. This is a more expressive uh, medium. Whereas the, uh, go up here. This column is the one where you want to use for <laughs> insight-driven analysis. Because that non-negative factorization means things can only add up. The only interaction you can have is adding and so you can't have these complex interactions that, that kind of hide the, the, the real meaning of a, of a dimension. And it's that that gives you this ability to, to take the model, pick it up, and, and look at it as an artifact. You can, you can look at each of the columns and look at them individually and, and sort of see the meaning of them. And that's what gives you this ability to give an overview. Now, of course, they're not really an accurate model, and, and often the critiques I get of topic model, I'm, what, what I hear is this. Uh, but they're really useful in that sense. They're, they're, if you think of them as a miniature that gives you some sense of insight, then um, I think that's a, a really interesting and, and uh, valuable and potentially useful way of thinking about modeling. So I'll just stop there. And uh, thank you very much.